Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a conversation with my friends and I have here today with me, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh. We got we have such a <laughs> such an exciting um talk for you guys today. Welcome in, Noms. I see you there with the first. Welcome in, welcome it's in. It's a noms. It's a noms. It's a noms. So oh. Landon, what is it that they can look forward to today? What are we talking about? We are talking about adaptations. A huge mm -hmm. part of fandom is the taking something and making it into something else so it's digestible in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we want to talk about mainly the different kinds of adaptations between movies, TV shows, and books. And why how you consume it changes the material that you're consuming. Because we talk a lot on this show about all types of media. We have done analysis episodes on all three, on, on books, mm -hmm. on TV, on movies. I know books is our main focus, but we do the others as well. And we're constantly bringing up like why this is good in a movie or a TV show or a book um, and how that contrasts. So we wanted to do an episode where we talk about those thoughts in general so that you guys can kind of understand where we're coming from, because we do approach each of these mediums um, quite differently when we're trying to decide, like, what do we actually look at to determine if we feel like it's good or bad, <laughs> you know, because yeah. um, we spend a lot of time ragging on the things that we analyze as well. We like to point out the bads because that's fun. It's fun to be a hater. And um, but uh, but we we wanted to just talk about like why some of that is and the advantages and disadvantages of these different pieces of mediums. Um, yes, absolutely. So, so yeah, so I will show you guys like what what Landon has built for us. It's very beautiful. Look at this. I think Look at this cute thing. Thank you. All. I just also <laughs> wanted to say that to make sure that people know that we're not going to be talking about anything non-fictionary or non-fictionary. Yeah. Oh my god, non-fiction, documentary, it's nothing like that. Obviously, those mediums are its own sort of media. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really just taking fictional, usually speculative stories and figuring out what best adaptation to give it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really do not. We really do not do documentaries here. Um, we do we do fantasy, sci-fi. The closest thing we've ever done to to that is um, Hamilton as a piece of historical fiction. Uh, that was fun, but um, yeah. trying to actually do some kind of um, analysis or whatever on like actual Alexander Hamilton's life, like that's not our bag. We're not here to really uh, analyze real people, just fiction. <laughs> Just fiction. I do not feel like doing that much research. <laughs> no, that sounds like that sounds like a pain in the ass. It's a lot. <laughs> That's work. We're not here to work. We're just here to to put out for you guys the stuff that we do for fun, anyways, which is talk to each other about movies, books, and TV movies, books. and TV shows. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, what are these differences? Mm -hmm. And I feel like we need to start with the big one, the one that we have done the most on this on this uh, podcast or Twitch for uh, the one that I certainly consume the most of, uh, and that would be books. Oh no, let's start here. Sorry. Oh yeah. Why we kinda, that we kind of talked about this. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's like that idea of how you consume something changes the medium and the meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're going to binge it fast because you need to get through it fast, like a TV show, or even a movie, if it's only an hour and a half, that's going to change than reading a 700 page book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like adaptation, adaptation matters because a creator is taking a, a piece that already exists and they are kind of in a way putting their own stamp on it, sharing it in a different way so that the, 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 the themes can be absorbed in a different way. And I do feel like adaptation is somewhat akin to fan fiction, right? Which is why I believe we are qualified to talk about this. <laughs> um, I think because we're both we're both swimming in the fanfic type of stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that the uh, I do agree that it's like fan fiction. However, I think because it involves a fan fiction is very low stakes. Even one person can read your story. Uh, Ten thousand people can read your story. Uh, Either way, there isn't any real money involved. There isn't really any real stakes involved other than maybe reputation. And in some ways, if you're writing fan fiction to build a catalog to become an author, that's that's its own thing. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about adaptations of TV shows and movies, we're talking millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Yeah. Uh, we're talking about thousands of people's jobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and be- and also, not to mention, the people who love it and are attached to it and the fans that have to consume it and appreciate it, uh, a lot a lot of them are going to have a lot more opinions on, you know, a Star, Wo- Star Wars prequel or sequel uh, than necessarily they would about some Raylo fan fiction. Oh my gosh, what? I mean, no one's actually reading my Obi can fix Landon. No. Say it ain't so. Well, they will if you change all the names, give it a modern setting, and then publish it like a book. Well, I mean, I'm just saying. Yes, noms. Oh my gosh, isn't it true that um the 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 Eighth Doctor audio stories that those kind of um pushed forward the revival of Doctor Who that happened in like whatever mid early 2000s whenever the ninth doctor stuff came out i don't remember it was a long time ago um but i feel like that was the case in the doctor who fandom the doctor who fandom was doing some crazy stuff and the bbc was like oh my god people like doctor who again the fuck let's do this it was also stephen moffat yeah, stephen moffat who had proved himself as a as a showrunner uh was like hey big fan of this thing can i make it mm-hmm. uh and they were like yeah we'll there's not only a call for it in fandom, but also we trust you with our money. Um, obviously, British TV is very different than necessarily American TV, but yeah. that's kind of what happens. So a- adaptation ap- adaptation matters. Um, adaptation pushes a story out to a new audience so that they can enjoy it as well. Um, and the whole reason for that is because different mediums have different advantages and disadvantages. So now, actually, we're going to talk about books. <laughs> We're going to talk about books. Mm-hmm. I just was so excited to talk about books because it's my favorite thing to talk about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. um, I feel like it is my it is my belief that most, if not all, but most things that are being adapted start out at book, as books. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, books are t- typically the first source, the primary source, if you will, uh, should you want to make an adaptation. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for this. A- it's a medium that's been around for a lot longer <laughs> than TV show or movies or, or anything else. Yeah. Uh, other than maybe plays. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, novels <laughs> Novels have um, have hundreds of years of, yeah. of history, let alone just the idea of, of binding stories into books, period. You know, regardless of the, the modern like novel structure. I also think it's one of the most easily accessible, even in modern day. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of of getting literature, a um, schools at least here in the United, I can only speak from here in the United States. Uh, most schools have libraries, and mm-hmm. most schools also have curriculum that involves reading, which means reading is built into our educational system. Whereas movies and TV shows aren't, even though a lot of kids are consuming them at young ages. Yeah. Uh, public libraries are free. Uh, and accessible even in the modern day that I could literally right now rent a rent or check out a book from New York City Public Library on my phone as yeah. we talk right here. So it's really accessible to everybody and free, most importantly. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas TV shows and movies still require some money out of your own pocket, whether you know you're doing it or not. Yeah. So I think I think there's really two main things with books that contribute to all of that is one books is only words on a page so the only thing yeah. the only skill you have to master to create a book is writing whereas mm-hmm. if you want to make some of these visual mediums it's not just about your writing you got to have good writing too but then you have to have actors and you have to have lighting and you have to have camera work and you have to have you know visual editing which is much harder than editing um a book it takes a lot more uh, a lot more varied skills to do that so it's it's only words on a page and because a book only requires a certain set of specific skills a singular person can make a really bomb ass good book okay yes if you think about visual mediums the only other visual mediums where only one person can do it is like youtube videos and tiktoks right like one person can make those are they nearly as good as a tv show or a movie most of the time no yes okay there are some amazing youtubers and streamers myself obviously everything i put out is pure art i don't know what these other motherfuckers are doing but <laughs> Yes. But um yeah, objectively true. But uh but it takes a lot more varied skill set. 
And it is much harder, if not impossible, in a lot of ways for only one person to realize the vision of a TV or a TV show or a movie. But with a book, that's not true. One person can conceivably create one and it be like one of the best things that um, someone has ever experienced in a story uh, because of that. So so yeah. because of those reasons, it is um, it is much more accessible. All you got to do well, is know how to read. Yes. And also on top of that, it's not only the amount of people, but it's also the amount of hours that mm-hmm. go into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is completely possible to write, edit, and publish a fully drafted novel in the course of a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Chuck Taylor uh, like, does it all the time. Yes. All the time. <laughs> uh, self-published authors, TikTok authors do it all the time. Uh, some of my favorite authors have books coming out three to four times a year. Uh, and it's because of how fast they're able to sit down, produce, edit, and mm-hmm. there isn't a whole team of people behind them. And there isn't a whole, the, the amount of hours they have to put put in is significantly less. Uh, so like with a TV show, even though TV shows typically come out on a yearly basis, although that's now that we're getting away from from uh, when we're now going to, more towards streaming, that seems to be changing a little bit, but Typically, the traditional TV show was yearly basis, but the amount of hours it took to get the to get the people filming it, to it edited, to this, it's like a ridiculous amount of hours. People were working around the clock on it, even though it is fast, it is just as fast, if not faster than some authors. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that the the fact that it takes so few people and that self publishing exists also allows for a lot more freedom when it comes to what you can do for uh, niching down and marketing of books, because you have the ability to have it uh, be a singular person's vision produced very cheaply. So you can be successful with only selling a few thousand copies, um, depending on how quickly you produce and how dedicated your fan base is, right? But that is not true when you're talking about some of these other visual mediums. If you have only um, a few thousand viewers of a TV show, you ain't getting a second season. It is not happening, right? But with a book, that might be enough success for you to keep going depending on your, you know, the rest of your life's situation, right? Like that could be okay. for other similar mediums where it's just kind of one person, there are plenty of streamers that only have a few thousand viewers regularly, and that's enough for them. That's a whole career, you know, and and books are kind of the same way in that regard. Um, in addition to all of those things about the creator where it's beneficial, it's also got a lot of benefits to the actual consumer as well. Something unique to books is that the reader can go at their own You don't get that with a visual medium, right? Like if you're watching a TV show, you're watching a movie or whatever, pausing it and restarting it is is a little bit annoying, but that's the closest thing that you have. With a book, though, you can literally read it slower or faster. You can be like, this is boring and skip down a few paragraphs, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot really do that with a visual medium without seriously missing stuff and hampering the story for you. And that's just not true when it comes to books. So, um, you know, book lovers, I understand why you love your books so much, you know, and you think that it's the bestest, best medium ever. Like, I totally get it. I totally get it. Uh, and I do appreciate, I am not a pauser of books at all. I am kind of a binge, binger of books, but I totally understand when like someone, you know, being able to end at a chapter or even in the middle of a chapter or finish a page is truly able to just like pick right up where you started because inherently with how books are written, even if you don't exactly remember what just happened, you'll remember because you'll be reminded throughout the scene. Yeah. Whereas in a scene, because it is so imperative and that, especially in movies, where time is a limited factor, every single moment of every single second of every single shot has to be, like, accounted for and to have a reason why. Books don't need that on the whole. That line of dialogue is not the most important line of dialogue throughout the entire book. It's probably necessary because someone liked it. But it's not, but it, but it is not imperative. Every single sentence is not imperative to the overall story. Yes, true. Can't wait to dive into 70 plus 
eighth doctor novels holy shit that's a lot of novels so Jesus much easier than the, stuff, the audio stuff's better for the treadmill boredom yeah i mean i do a lot of audiobooks as you guys know i've talked about that a lot so there's certain benefits of books that i don't typically get but i'm just simply too busy to sit and read that's just how that is sorry um so you know it, i i need i need the audio book um People wanted their doctor back exactly, and then and then we got Christopher Eccleston, and it was awesome um, when they brought when they brought him back. So I think I think that the other thing in regards to books that is so um, that is so cool that we're kind of dancing around is that the imagination when it comes to books is truly unlimited. Like okay, Landon, I don't know if you've ever read a Chuck Tingle book. I'm going to reference him again. I have not. Um, okay, so in Chuck Tingle books. All kinds of craziness happens. Like I'll I'll do I'll talk about the because we've talked about this one before. And so I don't have to really explain. Oh, it. The, the okay. Harry we've talked. Yes. The That's Harry right. Potter book, right? The, the Harry Potter knockoff book or whatever. The one yes. riffing on it. There's two characters that are motorcycles and he never has to just because it's a book. He never has to explain to you how these motorcycles walk around or wear clothes or or touch other people or, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. He can just say the motorcycle gave her a hug or like other wacky sentences like that that simply cannot exist in a visual medium. Like in a visual medium, you'd have to consider so much more to make that something that the reader could potentially get immersed in. But in a book. You can just say it. And so long as you've set up the tone as kind of like wacky and crazy like that, people are just going to be like, of course the motorcycle gave her a hug. Like, why the fuck would it not? They have a bond. Duh. <laughs> like, and it's yes. okay. Um, but that's just not going to be true when you've got an, a visual medium. So you get so much I, more freedom. I also think along with that is that because there is almost an un imagination is unlimited, uh, there's a lot of people accessing writing stories, which means a lot of the same stories are being written, which might sound like a bad thing to those of you who do not like books. But as someone who is a romance novel consumer, I could probably do it for a living with how much I'm reading romance these days. It's so nice <laughs> to just like slip into a trope that you've read a thousand times and not need it to be unique or special or something. I have read so many books recently with the same trope that I'm just like, I don't, I couldn't pull one scene from another, but I liked all of them. <laughs> don't yes, know which one, which one this happened in. <laughs> yeah. Terry Pratchett's an excellent example of what I'm talking about to noms because like he does the same thing. There's, there's just things that you're happy to accept in writing that when you try to adapt it to a visual, it just doesn't. It, it doesn't take you along in the same way. Like you can't believe it in the same way. You can't feel it in the same way. Um, yeah. 100% totally. And yeah, I also, it, Landon, everything you're saying is kind of like, it's kind of like the two cakes meme. And it's like, oh, but my cake yeah. doesn't, my cake isn't as pretty as the other cake. And then people that like cake are like, fuck yeah, two cakes. Yes. Exactly. I I, I also think that there is uh, something nice about, oh, what was that? Sorry, I had the thought and then it left my brain. Sorry, I destroyed worst. it with making you think about cake. <laughs> I am now like, mm, cake. Uh <laughs> No, um, I'll, it'll come back. But okay. I think that that books also, um, oh, this is what it was. Uh, again, back to that visual idea. It is so much less invasive for a book to tell and not show. Yes. Uh, because even Preach. though as writers, we're told to show and not tell, and ninety percent of books are showing and not telling. Mm -hmm. Not even ninety. There, there is a certain amount of you need to tell. Yes. And that's so easy and nice, both as a writer, but also as a consumer yes. to just be like, and then she walked over here. Yeah. Perfect. I don't need, I don't need to think about it. I don't yes. need to take into consideration the soundtrack that is playing in the background. Mm -hmm. I am not being manipulated by tone. I am just sitting here reading about a girl walking through a park <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's so true like the closest thing we get to that in the visual medium is the montage right but in a book a montage can be a paragraph and then you're done with it that's yeah. it it's done so easy um training montage one paragraph we trained i hated my trainer he was he pushed me so hard i'm so mad at him done move on well you know I also think what that inherently leads into the next point that books have over any other medium 
is the gift of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Time passing in books is a questionable thing. And like a lot of, a lot of mediums were like, how much time has passed? But in a book, if you want a book to take over the course of their entire life, like I'm thinking of the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo, it it takes the course of basically her entire life. At no point in time, does the book feel rushed? At no point in time does it feel like you're spending too much time on one time? At no point in time does it feel like an unbelievable story because of how much happens or how little happens in the course of her life. Mm-hmm. A TV mm-hmm. show or movie trying to capture that essence of time changing is it's impossible. Hard. It's really hard. Like I think of movies and TV shows that I've seen like that and it's like, you know, they have they hire this 30 year old actor. Right. And then for the then at first they have them embraces because they're a kid, but they're still 30 fucking years old. Right. And then by the end, it's like they've got all this makeup on them so that they look old. And it's like, oh, you're still 30 fucking years old. That's just a lot well, of makeup. You know, it just doesn't it's not as it's not as immersive. I think of the one of the best examples of like is the Harry Potter epilogue mm, of like mm. seeing all of the all of the adults being their 40 year old selves and just like but like had to change time but we were all like these are just the same people in bad wigs like it was so bad and yes. so gross and but like in the and not saying that there's a lot of good things about harry potter but at <laughs> least like it was believable when i was reading it that they had aged 20 years yes. or 19 years or whatever like it was like oh this is this is a believable thing <laughs> yes, the epilogue in the movies is, is bad for completely different reasons than it's bad in the books because of that visual yes. element. Like it just in my mind, you flashed it, it flashed to me like um, what the fuck's his name? Draco, Tom, Tom Felton, Tom Felton, yeah, Tom Felton in the epilogue, like looking like a teenager and supposed to be like thirty five, thirty six, or whatever he is <laughs> supposed or to like, be in the epilogue, and it's like and the then- heck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then like uh Rupert Grint standing yes. right there and also like looking like he aged properly, but also like not and this like super uncomfortable feeling that comes with that. Uh it just sucks. Like mm-hmm. you have the gift of time in books mm-hmm. because and also you have the gift of like sitting there and being like three weeks later. Mm-hmm. Whereas TV shows, and I d I don't want to talk about TV shows too much, but TV shows, uh especially when they're episodic on cable tv came out throughout the course of a year or or nine months typically started in september typically ended in may and so there was the passage of time with us as humans experiencing it and so we feel like like even if we don't try to attach we do attach that passage of time to our tv show characters so it's very natural to just be like oh this tv show took over the course of a year and then you're like, actually, the first three seasons of, t- of Vampire Diaries was only one school year. Mm-hmm. And, they have and to then tell you're like, you what? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense. Have a good taco time, noms. Have a good taco time. I, I think in addition to time, one of the big advantages of books is that they can t- contain so much more nuance mm-hmm. because because it's just text on a page. You can have things like an unreliable narrator and it's so much easier because like, okay, we as humans, when we're reading the story, we naturally want to side with the protagonist. That's the that's the person that we're following. That's um, often the narrator, you know, the one that we're seeing through their perspective or whatever. And when you can't actually see the person like in a book, how it's just words on a page, it's so much easier to have an unreliable narrator or an unreliable main character who is not telling you the actual events as they're happening, who's not including different things from different perspectives. Um, and But when you have a visual medium, that's so much harder. I try to, th- I think of like movies with like unreliable narrators and uh, and how how the fandom gets, and this happens with books too, but I feel like it's worse when it's a visual medium. I, I think about things like like um, Walter White Defenders and uh, Light Yagami yeah. Defenders, as we talked about when we talked about Death Note, you know? I feel like I truly haven't met somebody who has disliked a protagonist. They've disliked the lazy writing of the writer. Mm -hmm. But because we are so naturally trained and also like inserted into a story, we're going to naturally find ourselves 
attached to that character whose brain you're in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's it's just human psychology at that moment at that moment in time you are told that you have to like the things or want the things that the protagonist wants because that's mm-hmm. the story of the protagonist yeah uh yeah. and because and so because of that there is like so much i feel like deeper love for and understanding of characters in books whereas in a tv show or a movie you're just like fucking hated bella swan it's like, yeah, it's because you didn't know Bella Swan. Do you remember? This, I disliked the the lame writing of Twilight. <laughs> Bella Swan was a teenage girl who was just super insecure. She was every teenage girl. It's true. Do you remember? Okay, do you remember when the Fault of Our Stars adaptation came out? And people were like, I can't remember the boy's name, but people were Gus, like, Gus. August Gus. Yeah, people were like, oh my God, Gus is actually kind of annoying and an asshole. And I was like, yeah. But you loved him in the book, not because the actor did a bad job. The actor did a phenomenal job. You loved him in the book because Hazel Grace loved him in the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's more there's more room in books to have this nuance, to have these like different perspectives and things like that. When you put it on a screen and you can visually see it, it's a lot different Um, and you don't get to have that freedom nearly as much. I do want to acknowledge it's a lot more work. True. So it's a lot more work. If you are not, if you're not a strong reader, if reading is not something you can just like kind of stare at a page and do like second handedly without having to think about it, it's so hard to understand what is happening and why it is happening. And that in itself cuts off access for a whole bunch of people. Yeah. So I guess we're moving to the disadvantages now. Yeah. So I would say that is the biggest one. If you, don't know how to read, then you can't consume a book. Whereas it's a tiny, tiny population that doesn't know how to uh, listen. You know, most people can understand speech, right? Typically, if you cannot understand other people's speech, you have um, a very severe, uh, you know, mental disability or something of that nature, learning disability, right? Um, That's not true with reading. You can be a perfectly normal person, no developmental issues, and just miss the boat on learning how to read. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and hey, Koneko, hello. Oh, on vacation, on vacation, after your vacation, you'll have to tell me about it. Yes. Um, So, so with a book, this is just not the case, right? It's just not the case. You can be perfectly cognitively uh, able and fine and just missed the boat on reading due to various life circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a population that even though books are cheaper and easier in a lot of ways, they cannot access them. They simply can't. There's a huge amount of our population here in the United States. I want to say it's probably close to 25% of people who are completely illiterate, can't read, can't read at a third grade level. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that doesn't surprise me too. Uh, a lot of people don't have access to it. Books are expensive. It 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 is not a surprising thing, but it is means that this form of medium is a hundred percent not available to, them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that sucks because it is such a great way to consume something, and also the original of most of the things that are being produced these days. Uh, that it's 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 heartbreaking to know that that it's been cut off and inaccessible for a, major, a large portion of the United States. Mm-hmm. It really is, and unfortunately, the the like what you should do to combat that is to consume the audiobooks, but those are far more expensive than the regular books. And then also far you have, more. and then you also you have the you have the with I feel like you have the things that still get in the way of TV shows and movies of like, it is a huge, it is in my, in like, in my case, a longer time commitment because you have to actively be listening to it for 10 ish hours. Uh, And it can't easily be put down because Mm -hmm. you're not actually, because in a lot of ways, when people are consuming audiobooks, they're not actively consuming the audiobook. They're passively Mm -hmm. consuming it. Which mm-hmm. means that if you just stop it, there's a huge likelihood that you don't remember or retain what happened. And when you pick it up again, you're going to be confused. Because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is harder to retain things that are just told to you. 
it is like in in for most people when it comes to retention and committing things to long term memory, there's kind of a hierarchy in in your brains. Visual is at the top. If you get something visual, like you will retain it. Um, next is like doing it. This one takes longer, but you'll really retain it if you get to practice a particular whatever it is, right? Um, and then next would be like reading it. And then finally would be just passively listening to it. Like for most people, now that's not true for everyone in every situation. And you have to take into account what the particular thing is you're trying to commit to long-term memory. But for most people in most contexts, that's basically how it is. That's just true. So you might say like, yeah. I'm a visual learner. So is everybody fucking else. Like that's, that's not, that's, you know, that's well, just how people are. It's hard. Also, our brain, like has trained on how to uh, filter out verbal stimuli or, or um, audio stimuli mm-hmm. uh, because there's so much noise happening constantly that our brain can't retain. And if yeah. it did retain, nothing would ever get done. That's why ADHD sucks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you're when you're like stimuli by something that your brain is supposed to have filtered out. Yeah. When you're listening to an audiobook, unless you are sitting down and doing nothing else and putting all of your energy into listening to this audiobook, your brain automatically begins the process of filtering things out. Yeah, it'll because it's, it's an automatic process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yep. You can be great at multitasking. I definitely know some people who like go onto the treadmill and, and work out and do audiobook or cook at the same time or anything like that, but it is not the same, it is not to the same level of reading. Still counts, it's but it's a different sort of it's a, it's a different medium altogether. Yeah, you you likely find yourself having to re-listen more often than you would have to reread, and this is just this is typical. So we are also talking about. I just want to acknowledge when we're saying all of these things, we are also talking about like the average neurotypical brain, yes, right? Yes, like yes, if yes. you are listening and you are severely um, autistic or something like that. Everything I just said probably doesn't apply to you because the way you retain information works differently. Um, So just acknowledgement of that. But but yeah, so books have a lot of lot of advantages, but the disadvantage that they have is very real and very strong. And when, when you're kind of determining what the medium is to tell a story and like how it should be done, that should definitely be taken into account. But I also think, like, not to switch back to the positives, but out of all of the other mediums, books have the most space and freedom for detail. Yes. Which means that the the elements in which you can tell a story and one that is impactful, as long as you can get over that hump of actually reading it, and it is, there's so much more room to work with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There is. So yeah, we love books, obviously. Um, but we read a we read a lot of them on this show. Uh, but we we love other mediums too. We talk a lot about TV and movies. So I don't remember which one is next, Landon, but I think we're we can go TV, TV shows. shows. Okay, TV shows. So I like to consider TV shows the in between of books and movies. Uh, you have more space and more time to play with because Mm -hmm. whether it be a six episode arc a 10 12 episode arc or a american season of 24 episodes you have time uh to tell the story uh and those can be anywhere between 30 minute episodes and an hour episode so you're working with up to 24 hours of content yep um and so being able to have that freedom to tell the story to explore the world I think really akins it to books much more than to movies but with tv shows it requires all the same things as movies so let's start with our positives okay so um positive is that because you have so much more time you can get almost as nuanced in a tv show Mm -hmm. as you can in a book which is why when it comes to some of your favorite modern adaptations these days it's probably something that started as a book and moved to a TV show. 
because you can get to that level of not only nuance in the story, but nuance in the characters. So because you have so much more time in a TV show, you can include like whole conversations that really do nothing else except establish certain character traits, right? And certain character thought patterns, whereas Mm -hmm. you always get time to do that in a book, but in visual mediums, you don't always get time to do it. But when you have a TV show, you kind of can. And I feel like this has even been really elevated lately with um, with streaming and binging and things like that. And HBO has done a lot of this where they're like hour long episodes. It doesn't have to be who says if we can make an episode that's 90 minutes. We can make an episode that's 45 minutes and both of them be in the same TV show. Yeah. Who cares? Right. And um, so because of that level of freedom when it comes to TV shows, especially streaming TV shows, you get all these little details in there. And those details can really stick in your mind and be really easy for you to recall because you've got the visual on top of the dialogue and the narrative of what you're seeing. So I love TV, obviously. (laughs) I also think that there's something to say about the fact that like, TV is so much more engaging, like like passively engaging than mm-hmm. a movie or a book because each episode, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 90 minutes, whatever, has the abil- has a story arc built into it. Mm-hmm. Every Visually. single every almost every single TV show, even the bingeable kind, need to have a sort of, you know, exp- exposition, rising action, conflict, climax, resolution, all of those traditional things that were taught about how to tell stories. And that's because it needs to be engaging. It needs to engage. So what you basically just have is a collection of free floating plots that are also Mm. interconnected. And it makes it really engaging because at any point in time, you are the, you are being told a story. You don't have to like read a 300 page chapter to sit there and be like, what is the point of this? Or like, what, is, what does this matter? You just have to sit through one TV show yeah. and, or one episode and you feel all of the feelings that you would with a natural story arc. Yep. And because of this, we get to something that is unique to TV shows. You don't really see this in other mediums, but it is the art of the sitcom. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess a sit, hypothetically, a sitcom book could exist. Sitcom esque movies definitely exist, not anymore, um, but they used to. But TV shows, you can still make a sitcom. And the whole reason you can make a sitcom in a TV show is because every week you're spending your 30 minutes or your hour with these characters, getting to know them to where what matters to you more than the overall plot is how these characters interact. You have your little buddies on screen, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I turn on Abbott Elementary, right, I want to know what they're all getting up to. I want to know what what crazy thing Barb's going to say this week, you know, or whatever. (laughs) I want to know if um, Janine and Gregory are finally going to get together. They're not. Um, it's only season two. You, we're, we think they're getting together, but this, they're probably going to, probably Janine was telling the truth and they're going to have another want, won't they, before they will they at the end of season three, you know, right? So you can have this with a TV show because you get your little, your little bite-sized chunks, right? Every single yeah. week, kind of like having your play date with your actual friends, you know, every week or whatever. Oh, it's the weekend. Time to go hang out with Landon on the interstage window, right? So uh, so the TV shows you un- are unique in that way that you can have in a TV show some of the um, most compelling uh, characters. Like you can feel for them and about them in a way that is very hard to do in mediums that don't give you those little like bite-sized chunks every yes. single week well i think and then i think this, that's like the birth of the ensemble cast mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like there's been ensemble books prior where like thinking of lord of the rings but even yep. lord of the or rings of thrones, which i think is a great game of thrones um but even then the story is about frodo the story is about Jon snow mm-hmm. like yes mm-hmm. you can have an ensemble but there is a main character you could say that that's true with TV shows. However, the ensemble cast is certainly much more welcome. Uh, and you find in fandoms a, a large variety of who people's favorites are. 
Uh, whereas in a book, your favorite's going to be the protagonist because you're inside their head. Yeah, exactly. Like if you were to ask me who is the main character of Parks and Rec, for example, obviously it's Leslie Nope. However, Leslie Nope is not the end all be all of the show. There are plenty of episodes that really aren't about her. You know, mm-hmm. and those episodes are great. There's nothing wrong with them. Whereas in a book, it's not really like that. Like, yes, Game of Thrones is an ensemble cast with multiple narrators, right? But if the particular character's narrative does not relate back to what is happening with Jon Snow or or fear of what Daenerys is doing over in Essos, then it is fucking irrelevant It is. And there's a reason I will tell you, y'all, there's a reason that a bunch of publishers told George R.R. Martin, don't embark on this. It's not going to work. And now he hasn't written the final books and he probably never will because he's finding out how hard this is to do in that medium. It's not designed for it where a TV show is, Is. you know, if D&D were better, we could have had a good Game of Thrones ending. I believe that, but they're not. And so we didn't. (laughs) It's true. Uh, and I, I also think, again, that's that's the adaptation from taking a book and then having to pick your favorites. Like, and, that, see, and Game of Thrones is its own thing. It took a book with an ensemble cast that was, was truly being equal and acted like an ensemble cast and turned it into a TV show and then followed the stream of the book, which made the TV show, show feel off a little bit because... It was about John and Daenerys, and they didn't have the ending. Yep. And so, so they miss it and they misadapted it. <laughs> pretty much. So I, I can tell you one thing in particular that I know probably threw them off a lot that started cr- to create the problems in the TV show is that all the characters have to have actors. And those actors want to be in as many episodes as they can so they can get paid because they would like to eat and have a house, right? As everyone would. And so then they do things where they give like um, Theon, for example, right? Like in the books, Theon goes off and he comes back and he's this new character, Reek. But in the show, Theon is played by a guy who needs to eat, right, every day to stay alive. And so they actually show the transformation of Theon to Reek, right? Which is cool. Like I'm not saying that that was a bad choice, but you can see how that choice had to be made and I know we've never analyzed Game of Thrones I don't know maybe someday we will but maybe not because George R. R. Martin will never finish it but anyways if he ever finishes it then maybe we will analyze it oh the book we're not gonna analyze the book I don't think it's ever gonna happen but anyways um so then there's lots of these decisions that happen throughout where things are added or cut because the they have to be because the actors Mm -hmm. are real people that gotta get paid and Again, so, it's it's introducing more than one person into yes, your project. The yes. more complicated the things are going to fall apart and be more complicated the more people you introduce. Another great example that I would love to do one day. Uh, Damon and Elena from Vampire Diaries broke oh up God. because Ian Summerholder and Nino Dobrev broke up. Yes. Right? Like... <laughs> and, then the, and then the show is too cowardly to let Damon be with Bonnie. Okay? Yes um another great example of being like oh yeah elena's the main character she's gone for two seasons just straight mm-hmm. up not there did we notice nope. not really because she's the I worst mean, character the show was already getting bad at that point That's so <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it is that it is that concept of like okay you can love a lot of people and there's also interconnected plot lines but i think as much of a positive as that is there is also a detriment there because just like the more people you have the more plot lines you have the more innate ways to tell a story the harder the overall plot line is Mm -hmm. to be told and that is like where tv shows lose the plot like literally it is that like too many cook situations so easily (laughs) you have 24 episodes of which you have to have make sure that there's a conflict for every single one of them and a resolution for every single one of them ish as well as typically an overall conflict yes through the whole season and then that's the problem is that you have to then have also episodes that are like the climax of the overall conflict or that build those conflicts. And how do you weigh that, satisfic- that satisfying while also playing the game of, I don't know if I'm going to be renewed. 
Mm -hmm. Because then on top of all of this, there is hypothetically an overarching show conflict, an overarching uh, show point. Mm -hmm. Uh, Except that when you don't know if you're going to get season four, you can't build your season one conflict to build to season four's climax because there's no guarantee that you're going to get to season four. You yeah. have to focus on this season, which right. means that every single season feels like its own disconnected island in some ways. And when you start having that separation and disconnection, plot holes get introduced. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what fandom loves more than anything else is pointing out gaping, gasping plot holes. <laughs> Are you saying that fandom likes gaping holes? <laughs> I'm saying that there's enough fan fiction to prove that. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, in addition to there being a too many cooks situation in the ways that Landon just pointed out, there are lots of other ways that too many cooks kind of get in the way of TV shows. So there's there's TV shows have the special predicament of too many cooks and unknown amount of time they they kind of get together in into this this big ball of wtf okay it's happening again there's a writer strike you guys i don't know if you've heard you probably have we've been through this before last time the writer strike gave us destiel sorry if you like it i do not um Did it? N- yes cast castiel would not have existed if it weren't for the writer strike so the oh, only I didn't reason know that. Yes, that is true. Castiel came about because of the writer strike because they had but not, to end the but season. But not the choice, but not the choice that he then is in love with Dean. That that was not because oh, of the writer's strike. Well the fandom made that. But see the thing is, is like, okay, so they had to end the season in an awkward spot because of the writer strike. And mm-hmm. so they introduce Castiel, and Castiel's like, I raised you up from perdition. The ship was born. Okay. It, from the from go, from go, there was no world where that ship wasn't going to sail, sure. right? <laughs> so, um, I did love Cass. Like that's that is a reality. I understand. Though. I understand. It was I was poisoned by uh, Dusty Heller's. It's not Cass's fault. It's not mm-hmm. Misha's fault. It's not the writers that did the best they could. No, the fandom considering sucks. the strike. Right. I mean, whatever. That's. Maybe we'll have to talk about that at some point. I don't think we could do all of Supernatural. No, we might have to talk. I about can't. Like, that I can't at some stand point. doing all of Supernatural, but we could do is fan of deep dive. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. So yeah, the writer strike is happening again. Um. I do think this time something that I am appreciating a lot more is a lot of shows are saying like, "There's a writer strike right now. We're not gonna. We're not gonna try to like work around this. We are just gonna pause production." We're just gonna we're just gonna pause. Um, I love. I think. That. I, I love. Think, um, I think enough. I think the political tide of Hollywood has turned enough, and in the world enough to sit there and be like, mm, you know, who's the evil? Corporations. We've been writing about this for about ten years now. How corporations are the evil doers in in most media's. So. Everybody is involved in that. The writers, the actors, the producers, the directors. Uh, So anyone who gets to call the shots that isn't directly tied to the corporation uh, is like, yeah, no, it's fine. We'll wait. We'll wait here. Yeah. Like one of my favorite shows ever is um, I think in post-production right now, Severance. Okay. If you have not seen Severance, you need to go watch it. It's on Apple TV. It's absolutely fucking amazing. Anyway, they're in post-production. They have the writer's team at this point is very tiny. They don't really need them. But in solidarity with the writer's strike, they chose to pause production on that show. And they're not the only one. There's several shows that have chosen that. And the whole reason these things can happen is because TV shows uniquely take a ridiculous amount of people and time to make. Like TV shows can be like a good successful TV show can employ someone for a decade, okay? Yeah. So the the temporality of TV shows is both a large advantage and a large disadvantage. And due to the typical machinations of capitalism, what that means is usually a show is bad for like two or three seasons before it ends. So uh, TV shows are not as good at showing um, long arcs 
So where they excel is having amazing characters that you can connect to where they have problems is trying to show like overall like arcs or or make like really salient points about the world because of the nature of the temporality and the amount of people that work on a TV show. Yep. <laughs> it's a first of all, just want to say we support the writers. Absolutely. Uh, companies are evil. And it, it the other thing with this too is it's not just like the politics of like writer strikes that affect it, but it's also like if your company gets owned by someone else who has a certain political view that tends to change the tune and tone of the show. Uh, I know that for Nashville uh, was an ABC show that I loved uh, was then bought by the country music network or something like that. And the amount of religion that suddenly showed up in that show was a lot. Well, now I know why uh, I want to stop talking about Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, CMT. That's what. I, yeah, the yes, CMT, CMT purchased it, and and it it got far more, uh, a little bit more country and a little bit more Nashville and a little less mainstream TV. Mm. Uh, and mm. not in a bad way. I still <laughs> I still enjoyed it. It was still fine, but it was like, oh, there's suddenly a change, uh, and you start seeing that in TV shows over time. Uh, and and then also it's hard to capture an audience for years let's be honest it's it's really easy if you have purchased a book you're in that book it might take you a year to read that book but you're in it you're mm-hmm. gonna you're gonna finish it if you at least start if you get a decent amount of way into it if a tv show goes on for 10 years it's really hard to stick with that TV show. Yeah, you probably Thinking, didn't watch it the whole 10 years. Probably not. I didn't watch. I was a Supernatural fan. I yeah. cut out season five. Yeah. Well, that was the right decision. <laughs> it was. Uh, but like that same, that same thing happens in most TV shows of like, mm-hmm. oh, here's here's a huge one. Firefly Lane, which is on Netflix. Yes. Love it. Fantastic. Great show. Can't bring myself to watch season three. Why? Because season two happened so long ago and I don't feel like getting into it. And and also this is like change. I have changed over the course of the last three years yes. of which the three seasons have had, which means my tastes have changed. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. where I want to be watching and what I want to be doing with my free time, which means that it's hard to predict what is actually going to be a hit. And all of a sudden people have to write for the trends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when tv show because it takes so long to produce is still behind the trends yep yep it's not unusual for for people to watch the first few scenes of a tv show and then just stop yeah because it's like i don't like this anymore i'm done with it i'm not gonna waste my time especially if you're not purchasing it like there yeah. is no buy-in power netflix has thousands of options for you True. to watch uh, and then that's only one streaming site. If you have Hulu and Prime and Dropout TV and... <laughs> uh, I don't have that one. <laughs> you should. And Peacock. Dropout is the D&D network that I love. Oh, okay. uh, it's the college humor thing. Um, I see, I see. And Peacock and this. All of a sudden, not only do you have thousands, you have like probably close to hundreds of thousands, it feels like at that point. Oh my god, yeah. Um I feel like I feel like this is something that's been true of TV back when it was on network TV and still now with streaming. There's just simply so many choices. Mm-hmm. Like even TV back in the day before streaming, you you were competing with so many different things. Like if you wanted to watch your show, you would tune in every week, right? But let's say the time slot moved and now it's an inconvenient time slot for you. Then you don't watch it anymore, right? This is what they did to X-Files, okay? I am still bitter, okay? It was back in like the 90s or whatever, but it was a terrible thing to do. Why the heck did they move their time slot? And but it was- uh, <laughs> Sorry, you know, but on streaming, like it's still the same. Like it's not time slot moves or there's now something else in that time slot that's more interesting. Now it's just like the sheer plethora of fucking content but that is like so i feel that the where we have it now is so much harder to engage in shows than before because before it was like oh lost is on monday nights or mm. sunday nights so i know sunday nights at seven i'm busy mm. i'm watching unless you had unless you were a part of those like cool houses that had like tivo 
I'm busy. Uh, I'm watching Lost. And on Thursdays is Great Grey's Anatomy at 7. So I'm watching that. And on this is that, like, you could schedule out your week. And people did, mm-hmm. depending yes, on when did. the TV shows came out. And that was time that was limited. Mm-hmm. Because even though there were thousands of choices, you only had as many time slots as you had to fill up with TV shows. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yep. So now it's like, it's like, oh, I have to dedicate an entire weekend, if not two, to watching the show. Do yeah. I am I willing to dedicate that? Whereas I might have been willing to dedicate it that if it had been over the course of a year and spread out weekly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so like what what I to do nowadays is um my husband and I, like before bed, we will watch like an episode of something, right? That's just like kind of our ritual. But because there are so many choices, there's been multiple occasions where we were like halfway through a season of something or we had just finished a season and we were about to start the next one. We were like, ah, let's watch something different. We're bored of that now. Let's watch this other different thing that's caught our attention. And we never went back. Mm -hmm. We just we just never went back. We've only ever seen six episodes of that show. And that's just where that is. And it will always sit there. (laughs) Like That's happened to us so many times. So really, like when you are writing, you have to grip in your audience the whole way through. Yeah. That time commitment is now meaningless. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's also as someone who is like choice paralysis, because I make a thousand choices in my career every single day, I get home and then like the last thing I want to do is choose anything. <laughs> uh, the concept <laughs> of being able to like choose something on Netflix, even if I like it, is just like, I can't. And that's how <laughs> I end up watching the same six TV shows over and over and over again. It's not just my neurodivergent brain. It's my trauma brain. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think that's uncommon nowadays. And I, no, and you know, post COVID, especially we're all a little bit traumatized more so than, than we were in the past. So I think, and, yeah. I think when it comes to TV shows, like they are like my favorite medium, like I'm not going to lie. I love something episodic. I think it's a much better way to get to know the characters, which is the thing that interests me the most always uh, as a role player. You know, I'm most interested in the characters for the, for the most part. Um, it is the most challenging to produce and to consume uh, of all of the mediums that we discuss, even though it's the one I, I like the most, I do I do think it is the most challenging of all these three mediums. Yeah. Uh, and then you also have to have the investment of like playing the game of what platforms you're on, mm-hmm. because it's like, oh man, I hated I I have started to find Netflix has nothing that I want to watch or I'm just overwhelmed by it. But then Queen Charlotte came out. And I'm like, now I got to subscribe to Netflix. (laughs) I will tell you, I hate when something's on Netflix because when you open up the Netflix app, it fucking auto plays trailers. Mm -hmm. And I just I'm like, why are you making noise right now? I have not clicked play on anything. Why the fuck are you making noise at me? I hate it. And I hate it. And I don't know why they do it. It drives me crazy. But we keep it because there's stuff we want to watch on there. So we keep it because but. Oh, I just I out of all of them, I'm like becoming very um anti Netflix. Anti Netflix. Yes, yes. I'm becoming Netflix, anti I'm, like, I'm becoming <laughs> anti Netflix for a lot of reasons. Um but also continue to be on it because Bridgerton owns my soul right Aria, now. Aria, yes. The autoplay is like it's like uh, <laughs> uh, hello you all are right. never late you are never late um <gasps> yeah never, so, so that's our, a queen is always on time everybody right. else is just early that's right <laughs> so yeah tv shows i love them but they are quite challenging and then let's move to our third movies movies uh movies i feel are an integral part of storytelling but the worst form of storytelling possible <laughs> yes okay because you have limited time Mm-hmm. to tell a lot mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so everybody wants to be a movie like everybody wants to be a movie that's like the golden age of tv shows was tv shows trying to be movies in a lot of ways mm-hmm. if you were if you were there at the height you know of sopranos and game of thrones and hbo doing all that stuff like you know exactly what i mean everybody wants to be a movie and the reason everyone wants to be a movie is because movies are the most artistically challenging of 
all of these, right? Like even though I've said like TV shows are, are the most challenging and they are overall artistically, to make a good movie, you have to be on it because you get, you know, 90 minutes, between 90 minutes and two hours and that's all you get and you have to help people get to know the characters and give a fuck about the characters. You got to get your themes in there of what you actually want to say, right? You got to get your visuals on point. Otherwise people are going to be bored. They're not going to, they're not going to watch it because it requires them to sit their ass in one spot for 90 plus minutes. You have to keep them engaged for a long length of time. Okay. Artistically movies are the most challenging. Everybody wants to do it. I disagree. You think so? I think the people who are making movies want to be more like TV shows. I think I think maybe and that's lately, why that's not been lately. historically true. No, no, no. Historically, I will agree with you. But I think lately, since streaming, since movies have started coming out on streaming, since all since sequels became the rage, movies are acting more like t- like TV shows. Is that why I think movies I... kind of suck lately? Because I do think that movies kind of suck lately. We're getting so don't get, get me wrong. There's always those ones that stand out that people mm. are doing it for the artistic reason. We're not talking about that. Yeah, like everything I'm everywhere about all the at once amazing. I'm I, yeah. I'm talking about the blockbuster concept of things. I'm talking oh, yeah. about the 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 movies that are there to make money. Not necessarily the movies that are meant to like be the real award circuit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I kind of a... do hate the modern blockbuster, I have to say. Yeah. I kind of do. And I think that's because they're like, think of like Avengers is just a TV show. Avengers is just a TV show. We just that's now are oh, getting. Oh, sorry, I hit the mic. We are just now <laughs> getting enough episodes to call it a TV show. Everybody wants to be the MCU. Everybody, the MCU is not yeah. good. Okay, like I'm going to hate for a second. I'm going to hate for a second. What's really cool about the MCU is is the way that it takes all these disparate stories and stitches them together into kind of this like Oedipus, I mean, not Oedipus, um, Odyssey style epic. Okay, like the MCU is a modern The Odyssey and that is Mm -hmm. really fucking cool. But, you know, once they got to Endgame and they started the next phase and they didn't have this overall, you know, thing like like they had with Thanos who cares? They should have stopped and they kept going. And now everybody thinks they that they're going to gonna recreate the MCU and they're not because the MCU can't even recreate the MCU. The MCU is established. It's no longer what it was. And I'm not even angry at it for it. Have I watched any Avengers movie since no. Endgame? No, 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 no. no. Uh, who mostly. Would? True. Mostly because of COVID. I'm going to be honest. I it's loved true. going to the t- I loved going to the movie theaters and watching Big Blockbuster. And you know what? I lied. I watched Spider Man. I did watch that one too. I've watched a couple, but I don't care like I used to. I will. I tell don't you care like I used to. If you you can understand like how I feel about modern blockbusters versus how blockbusters used to be. Here's the movie that I'm excited for that I'm going to the theaters for. Thank you, thank you, Greta Gerwig, for this beautiful birthday present Yay. of the Barbie movie. I can't fucking wait. I I'm can't go wait see for it. the Barbie movie. It, it comes out right before my birthday. Like um, my birthday's on the 22nd. Um, it comes out on the 21st. So like it's a birthday present to me. Thank you so much, Greta. You knew exactly what to get me. I'm so I feel so blessed um to have you as a friend in my life. Like, um, I'm so fucking but they don't make movies like that anymore. They no, don't. This is the but, first movie in e- and well, I'm, ta- also, I'm not talking about just COVID, right? Like years. Co- yeah. COVID did kill it, but the MCU was killing it before. You know it's like COVID was just the final like nail in the coffin. You know what movie I really appreciated? Would have been better as a TV show, but really appreciated mm. the D and D movie. Oh, I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it was actually this good. season. It was very, it was very funny. And if you play D and D, I think it hits a great niche. And if you just like fantasy, I think it does a great job. Would have been better as a TV show. Uh, I also think that like this is my theory of like movies just want to be TV shows modern day is why they're so fucking long these days because you were talking about you were talking about how you have a 90 minute to maybe a two hour window no the average movie now is two and a half hours kill me and I'm just like that's three episodes you could have just made three a three episode miniseries. And it would have been more engaging, more interesting. I could have, like, had a bathroom break in between things without being scared to miss things. Mm -hmm. Uh, You could have had more compelling characters because you would have felt like you had more time. Like, all of these things. And then you have, and then also including in the things of, like, Dune, part one and part two. 
all of these concepts of multiple movies to tell the same story is just episodes dune should never be a movie did they try to do that and and like david lynch tried to do and like it was it was like what isn't that what they did <laughs> the, yeah T- timothy chalamet is yeah the dune no one, right? yeah no no i, I know but in okay. the past in like the 80s oh. they tried to do a dune movie too and also it was kind of like what I mean, there was I never, merits to I never it. Like, saw I, don't, it. I don't hate the original Dune movie, but like, it's really nothing like the books. It doesn't have anything to do with them, really. Um, <laughs> so Movies. yeah, I haven't been able to the theater since before the pandemic, and I don't plan on going back anytime soon. True, like I'm literally going to go to the theater as like this is like m- my birthday outing. This is like what I want to do for my birthday. We do not go to the theater. We used to go to the theater like two or three times a month, and I don't. Ever you have the movie pass, back. right? Yes. Yes, girl, I love movies, but I never ever plan to go back to that no. life. Like, and it's and I think you just hit like what it like it sparked it in my brain, right? It's because movies aren't movies anymore; they're TV shows. Why they're would TV I shows. go to the cinema to see a TV show? That that's dumb. Why? Especially especially if I wait a month, because like that was the other thing too. Movies, if you didn't see it in the in the time, you had to wait six months. Yeah, or and or now more, it's depending. like oh, wait a month, or it's on HBO the next day, <laughs> right? Like. Mm -hmm. Uh, there isn't a need to go out and I think that's killing the industry I think movies aren't made the same anymore Um, I do want to say that as like a pro movies movies are the only one of these three mediums that we're talking about and I think most storytelling mediums that are truly accepted as an art form books Yes. yes ish Books is there's, there's such a thing as a um, trash novel too that no one thinks well, no, is art. And I think I also think that like most people are like you most people couldn't tell me who what prizes what books won prizes this year. True. Most people could tell me who won the Golden Globe, a best movie. I think that's more yeah more likely that they could tell you that than they could tell and, you who and won I, Pulitzers. Then who could win Pulitzers or any of the any of the small little prizes too. Uh, I think that movies are considered by the mass medium a, 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 an art form, mm-hmm. uh, can be considered art and is considered art within the industry and outside of it. Well, TV shows, it's... even though they can be just as beautiful and just as wonderful and artistic, aren't considered that. Well, because here's the thing with a movie. If you've got a good movie that's actually structured like a movie then what you are doing is you are sitting down for one singular coherent experience that is visual, it's audio, and so it taps into your emotions very easily and conveys a ton of information incredibly efficiently. So you can go through an entire artistic experience in like this 90 minute to two hour window in one sitting and like go through all the catharsis, like the emotions and things like that. And because of that, a movie is so much like a play that we, our brains can very easily be like, oh yeah, art, art, art. The same yes. reason your brain can so very easily, if you watch a play, which most people don't because they're really expensive. But anyway, if you ever get a chance to watch a play, your brain can very easily be like, oh yeah, that's art. Like you can recognize it. You don't even really think about it. And a movie does the same thing. Mm-hmm. It does. Uh, I also think, like I actually, as you were saying, I was like, you know what movie was the most successful that I've watched probably in the last two years Mm. as far as feeling like art and feeling like a coherent story that wasn't just a piece of something else Mm -hmm. the menu oh did you watch the menu i did i did and you know i really enjoyed the menu i thought that was was a really good movie i was the best movie ever probably not but like there was a lot of plot holes and there was a lot of stuff where i'm like oh i wish you would have dug more into this thing that you're touching on here but like when i think about it like as a piece of art, I feel like I understood where the artist was coming from. I know exactly what they were trying to say. And I thoroughly enjoyed um, all of the characters and their different perspectives. Yes. And I think that that's the thing is because movies were so commercialized. And I think mm-hmm. because the industry blew up to what it did and then changed so swiftly, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's lost that a lot 90 percent of movies have lost that piece Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh and i think it's a failing industry because of it i think you're right like i'm trying i'm just trying to think like most movies are not that and you know another movie i saw that was surprisingly good 
Um, and probably nobody that's listening has seen this because it totally flew under the radar. Anyway, it was the new um, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers movie. It was a modern day Roger Rabbit, and it was actually good. Okay, I'm I'll telling trust you, you, if I'm you not, liked I'm Roger Rabbit, Roger Rabbit. So. If you like Two Frame Roger Rabbit, you will love this movie. It is so funny and really poignant and actually interesting, which Ooh. doesn't happen very often. That's and you good. know what? You know what people said? Okay, I'm um, we're gonna I'm gonna go back to negatives for a second. You know, everybody was raving, raving about how awesome the uh Puss in Boots 2 movie was. I watched that shit. No, it was not. I'm sorry. It was not. It was a mess. <laughs> it was incoherent. The the way that the characters intersected didn't make any sense. The villain was kind of lame, okay? And they had so much potential to do cool stuff with him, and it was just one kind of cool scene, and then he just was like, I'm evil. And uh, and everybody was like, oh, but it's so good. Accurate displays of anxiety. Yeah, that's one scene in the whole movie. Like, it wasn't that good. I'm sorry. It was a mess. Narratively, it was a mess. Disjointed as heck. Anyway. We should dive into the Shrek movies. Oh my god, we should. There is so much. There is so much there that's like good and terrible. And like, then just watch it get worse as Cap as like Money Grobbling took over. It was like a fantastic first movie. True. The first great movie, second art. movie. What the fuck is happening in the third movie? Puss in Boots gets his own spin-off. What is happening? I didn't watch the first Puss in Boots movie. I have to be honest. So like know. maybe I, I don't know maybe either. the magic of the second one didn't work on me because I never saw the first one, but I didn't. But everyone said the second one was so good. I was like, whatever. I can figure out what happened in the first one by context clues. I'm smart. And so we watched the second one. <gasps> Hello, Lunar. Thank you so much for the help. Hello. That's right. There's a there's a very scary wolf in the in the second Puss in Boots movie. <laughs> Anyways, that movie was not good. Y'all that liked it, I'm sorry. All right. Away from Puss in Boots and back towards the pros and cons of movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, another... I also think when we're talking adaptation, most things, uh, th- it's going to be less about the artistic mm. point of view of movies and more about that blockbuster trying to get seats. Yes. Uh, also, because of pre-production and post-production and how the movie industry is built, the amount of time it takes to make a movie, even though Game of Thrones can put out a 90 a ninety minute episode, uh, and have all of the things boxes checked that a movie would have checked the amount of time it takes to produce a movie versus how much it takes to produce a singular episode of game of thrones is an extraordinary amount of time mm-hmm. pre-production and post-production in movies is ridiculous yeah uh yeah. and then on top of that the industry of marketing uh tv shows aren't TV shows, once they're greenlit and approved by the studio, typically fall on a schedule uh, and they are marketed it out a little bit, but it's certainly not six months, nine months mm-hmm. that we're seeing movies marketed. Yes. Uh, I believe the most recent Star Wars movies, we first started getting trailers a year prior to their release. Yeah, and they started putting out teasers now of an, another Star Wars movie. I'm not sure if this is a troll. Oh, I didn't know that. I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it was like a troll on Twitter, but they there was something about like another potential Star Wars movie that has Rey in it. I don't know if it's real. I literally just saw it, saw it from scrolling. We'll see if it's true or not. Um, but yeah, marketing budgets for movies are insane. And I feel like because our attention span has changed so much due to technology, like due to technology and just the generation that's upcoming and the people that they're actually yeah, trying to market brand. toward, it, it no longer works to have such a long release schedule. Uh, because when you've been finding out that some, when you've been finding out, oh my God, I am an English major. Uh, (laughs) when you find out that something that you're interested in doesn't come up for nine more months, your Mm -hmm. brain will forget it. And Mm -hmm. the, the excitement and energy to, to have towards that will go out the window. Yep. Uh, so yeah, movies are a dying art basically is what we're saying. Yeah, um, movies now want to be TV shows and TV shows want to be movies and my brain can't handle it. It's all moving too fast and changing and I'm the old man yelling at the cloud. 
<clears throat> um, also because typically TV shows are owned by singular companies rather than produced by production companies. So thinking of it like Netflix is the main is the usually the only producer on Netflix shows and Netflix movies. Typically, uh, which means that individuals that have been given funding, but it'll typically be like just Netflix. Yes, uh, but the amount of funding you have to go find for a TV show is greenlit by the company that you're under, whether it be ABC, Netflix, whatever, Hulu. Mm -hmm. For movies, it is up to the creators to and producers to find their own funding, mm -hmm. uh, which takes a long time, but also means that they need to have basically their entire money situation up front rather than in-house. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, which means that you have to have a very clear idea of, and you always will be in TV shows as well, but of budget, of what your money is being used mm -hmm. for, of all of that, and then also convincing people to give it to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And it's knowing the politics. Movies. Yeah. And knowing the politics of who you're working with on that too, because you know that there are companies that won't work together on the same film. So like, if you're going to accept 200 million dollars from this company you know that you can't go to that company yeah. to get the last 100 million or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep for sure um <clears throat> i also want to talk just a little bit about how imagination is employed in movies because in movies the time constraints are are so small you're telling your whole story within like one chunk uh, movies do often call on you to use your imagination for things happening off screen. Um, mm -hmm. That's much more common in movies than it is in TV shows, which means that even though it is still a visual medium and it can engage you uh, in that way, the same way a TV show can, it typically requires just a smidge more brain power to consume a movie than it does a TV show, right? Just a smidge, not much, just a tiny little smidge, because typically in a movie, there are important things happening off screen somewhere yeah. that you're told about or that are implied through character dialogue or things of that nature. Whereas a TV show, because they have so much more time, they're a lot more likely to just like do a flashback, for example, than a movie might be. Yeah. I, the way that my brain processes that is that like in a book, I have access to inside the character's thoughts. I am yes. inside the character, even if it's not third person or even if it's not first person point of view, I feel I am inside experiencing what the protagonist experiences mm -hmm. for a TV show. I feel like I am inside the world, but because the nature of how that TV show is told, I am jumping around the world, not necessarily following one person. Mm -hmm. It feels like a fuller thing. Mm -hmm. uh, with a movie, I am, even though in some aspects you can follow multiple people in a movie, I am glued to a character. Uh, I yeah. cannot, I am not inside that character's head. I don't understand what that character is thinking and feeling. I am not privy to that. I am watching it and have to deduce it. Uh, and, but I am also not welcome to the rest of the world. I am literally just watching this character. Uh, yeah. And even though that that's not how all movies are made, that's the feeling I get of being like, oh, how much access to information do I have? And it's like, I have access to the whole of information in a book as far as the character goes. I have access to the whole of information of the world as far as the movie, or as far as the TV show goes. And I have very, very little information as far as the movie goes. Yeah, typically. And that's also what makes movies feel more highbrow and why up until very recently, everyone wanted to be a movie, even if they weren't a movie, right? Like how many authors... Um, I don't know if this is really still happening so much, but back in the day, there was there's a lot of authors that would write their books with the hopes of becoming a movie adaptation, and they would write it in this very visual way to make it easier to adapt. I'm sure you've read a lot of books that are like I, that. I think that a yes, yes, and uh, I think that that because that was the only way to make money in yeah, the industry it was too. Very marketable. You didn't make money that. from books you mean money from selling your film rights yeah uh so if you were trying to make a career out of writing rather than just being a writer as like an artist you had to make yourself marketable to film studios i think now it's less like that because books can be picked up for tv shows now yeah and as long as you have a book that is popular amongst people 
uh, then you your film rights will be sold. Yeah, or you could just get um, Bigless Diglas Wolfwood to tweet about your book. Did you see that? I did not. <laughs> okay, so Trigun an, is an anime that is getting uh, this in a re- revival right now. They they remade it basically, and the first season of the remake has come out. It's very popular. There is a very popular Trigun Twitter account um, called Bigless Diglas Diglas Wolfwood. Okay, Wolfwood is a character in Trigun. All right. And Trigun has a lot of Yaoi fangirls, okay? I'm not going to explain why that's not relevant to the story. What's relevant to the story is that Bigless Dickless Wolfwood uh, has a gajillion fucking followers and tweeted very earnestly recently about how much they loved um, This Is How You Lose the Time War, which is kind of this uh, this like gay science fiction novel that's out mm-hmm. right now. And um, it was kind of like nichely popular, but then... Bigless Dickless Wolfwood tweeted about it and everyone fucking went and bought it. And yes, that's true. And then Amazon noticed and they were like, oh, this is like a bestseller now. And like everyone's talking about it and um, marketers are talking about it. So if you want to sell books, you need to find some random fandom account that will earnestly tweet about how much they loved your book. (laughs) Yes. It was crazy. So know that when you write niche and for a niche audience, that when it's introduced to the public eye, it's not always successful. Oh yeah, that's true. I don't know. I mean, basically, this is. Like, I don't. Know, I don't like know a, this book, and yeah, it's, it's a, it's it might a, be a good one. But I don't know it I either. Can... I know it's gay in science fiction, and Trigun is also gay in science well, fiction. So hence the you know. Well, thing it's like things like Ice Planet Barbarians. Did you hear about this? this no, tell something. me that one. Okay. Ice Planet Barbarians is a romance about a planet, a different planet, where a human girl goes to a different planet and meets these human esque aliens and just fucks a lot. Okay. Uh, very, very lots much of smutty. Sex. <laughs> lots of alien sex. Okay. Uh, lots of very monster fucking sort of thing. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But then TikTok was like, oh, yeah, this is the thing. And and I think started genuine from some smaller creators who like read monster fucking sort of stuff. Uh, and, but then mainstream got it. And then it was like, we don't need a whole, we don't, we don't need this to be, a, this does not need to be a movie. This is, a, this is about a woman who goes to a planet and fucks aliens. This does not need to be a novel. Like, <laughs> and I it doesn't like... need to be, where it is as far as popularity goes um for the amount of people who are talking about it on book talk because it's not well written and it's not a good book and it's niche fandom it's very niche trope i feel like and i've never read the book so maybe the book actually is itself but i feel like if hollywood got a hold of that it would just they wouldn't be able to do it without making it super fucking racist that's like no and it and it is i mean because like (laughs) and also just like it's not i i haven't read i will be honest i haven't read the book not my not my cup of tea uh but the ex the the, like parts of it that i have read i'm also just like we don't need this kind of anti-feminist oh it's like that it's a romance novel and they're not exactly known always to have these sort of imagine imagine in in this strange you know, TikTok, Twitter marketing world. Imagine if we got an Omega Verse movie. Listen, <laughs> I'm so deep into what Omega would the Verse mainstream right now? do with Omega Verse? We've got not enough. Topic, you know guys. what? Here's I know we've gotten way off topic, but I'm reading so much. This is my own personal. I'm reading so much Omega Verse romance right now mm. that I needed to go mainstream because I've read through almost everything available on Kindle no. and I need more mainstream artists to get into it so that I can read more about it oh my god <laughs> oh my god the need is strong okay well anyways strong. Bef- before we get like way too super off topic we wanted to talk next a little bit about like how to adapt so when you're adapting something um I don't know if we have a slide for this or we not, do but okay I well, just anyways I just I just wanted to say, oh, there we go. What is needed to create a successful adaptation? Okay. So this is just me saying one-to-one adaptations are fucking stupid. I'm getting really tired of nerds going, that didn't happen that way in the book. I don't care. 
that's dumb. Okay. It's a different medium. Hopefully everything we have said up to this point helps you understand that like different mediums have different strengths and weaknesses. And when you try to adapt one-to-one, you just create garbage. You create something boring, um, because they're just not the same. So, so don't do that. Um, I it's dumb. understand to the, it is dumb. I do understand the concept of certain aspects or scenes or characters. And I know we're going to go into like, what are the important things, but like, if there's a really important scene in a book that fandom is really like cares a lot about, and then it doesn't show up or it shows up too early or it shows up for different characters, which has happened in several adaptations. (laughs) Uh, it, it, it's hard to like put that away i don't need a line for line fucking adaptation i don't want a line for line adaptation for something boring it would be so boring i might as well read the book because it would be better anyway mm. uh what i do need though is like if you're going to adapt something because it's super famous i need someone to like or like really beloved in a fandom I need someone to research what it is people love. And you know who's yes. doing that right? Netflix is doing it right with Bridgerton. This is something I, I have not I have, watched. Not, I've not, I have not read all of the books. But Shonda Rhimes, who is the executive producer, and Netflix, I feel like genuinely have a like feel for the heartbeat of what fans find really important and maybe it's the author who's also included in in it and is working very closely to the, with the project who find like the important things in each of the of each things and keep to the spirit of that even though a shit ton of things are changed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well that's what's really important right like when i think about like adaptations i enjoy versus adaptations that i think are dumb is um is what are the themes okay what are the major plot beats and why do people like this and how do we preserve that in a new medium i'm so sorry koneko i'm looking at my stats i don't see anything there i don't think it's me but i'll keep watching it um so if you have done those things if you have really thought about like what the themes and the major plot beats and like why people like this thing when you're doing your adaptation then I think that you have got the makings of a good adaptation. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to stick exactly to it, right? Like I'll I'll say an example of a good adaptation that is very different than the source material is is The Shining, right? If you've ever read the the book for The Shining, um, you'll know it's very, very different. Uh, But there was some some interesting nuggets in that book that – that uh that they wanted to like explore more and so in the movie they took the bones of the shining and were like let's explore these other themes that are present in the book but not really super touched on but i think are super interesting and then they end up with an adaptation that is very successful despite it being very different than its source material now they did piss off king quite a lot he hates the adaptation but it's not just about him sorry Steven. no he's not he wrote he wrote the book like and you sell your rights you don't get it you don't get a thing i think i think the mistake was is that most people in hollywood who jumped on adaptations such as let's think of our big ones our big boss blockbuster adaptations that i truly think changed the game lord of the rings mm-hmm, mm-hmm. harry potter mm-hmm. those are the two that come to my mind as well they are they're like the gold standard of good adaptation. exactly and they are in some aspects the first harry potter mm-hmm. is word for word with the book. almost tried too hard to be exactly and i think lord of the rings did too now the world got to be changed a little bit mm-hmm. uh is a peter jackson Mm -hmm, got mm -hmm. to got to explore the visuals of the world that uh jr jr martin oh my gosh jr (laughs) Tolkien, whichever that Tolkien wrote uh got to explore that and have a little bit of freedom with that but for the most part things were line by line Mm -hmm. and that trying too hard to be exactly i think set up the entirety of adaptations to fail yeah, because that so became think, the standard and expectation. I, 
But I think with those, the thing the thing is, is like, okay, the first Harry Potter movie adaptation is is too exact to the book, right? But as it grows, now they start making too many bad changes towards the end. But to in the middle, when you're talking about like the the third and fourth one there, those movie adaptations are so good. On an objective so cool. level, yeah. yes. Yeah. On a fandom level, pissed people off. Yeah, but, and that's were, the, but pro- the fandom was wrong is what I'm trying to say. The I know that the fandom wrong. is wrong. I And I understand that the fandom is wrong. But so many people dislike those adaptations and now dislike any willingness to like part from the original material because it was set up that way. Mm-hmm. I think that if every director had taken the approach of The Shining, of sitting there and being like, this is an adaptation. We are changing what is happening. We're taking what we want, leaving what we don't. There would be a little less need and things could be a little bit more free and interesting. I just feel like I just feel like when it comes to those two, because I do think those are very good examples of good adaptations that pe- they are the producers got the wrong idea about what made them good adaptations. And they just thought the accuracy is what made them good adaptations. But that's not yes. true. But that's not true. That's not what made them good. It's because they were accurate to the things that actually mattered and not accurate. Well, to the things and I that think weren't. but I An- think anime, let's make sure the- we're not getting spammy. Those, those are pretty big messages to send back to back. Thank you so much. Um. um so they, they got think, the wrong idea, I think. Producers got the wrong idea about why those were good adaptations. But I think the reason why is because they went word for word and they did, never had a they never had a handle on what mattered. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They never mm-hmm. like they and because of that, because fandom then went, this is what an adaptation is supposed to look like. Anything that tried to do what you're do what you've suggested as far as look at the themes, look at the plot look at what matters Mm -hmm. is shut down immediately Mm -hmm. because it's not perfect. It's Mm -hmm. not exact. So I agree with you that the reason why those are successful is because they did hit on the things, but that wasn't, that wasn't the intent. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and it, and it didn't matter if they then later tried to fix it. It, we, it was already too late. They, Mm -hmm. they nailed their own coffin. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I think there's a Lord of the Rings purist, too, that complain about, you know, the changes that Peter Jackson yeah. did make, even though they were fairly minimal and not really consequential. Like, oh, no, Tom Bombadil's not in it. Like, Tom Tom Bombadil's never going to be in, in a Lord of the Rings adaptation. That's easy to cut, and you have to cut something. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tom Bombadil loved I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure Peter Jackson felt very guilty about having to I'm cut sure, it. I'm sure he felt super guilty. So um, I... I just think I just think when it comes to like making a, a, a good adaptation, like there are challenges there and and but there is a way to do it successfully. And oh, yeah. there's no there but I will say also there's no way to do it where you're not gonna make fans mad because fandom is dumb. Okay, we are, and there's portions of fandom that if it's not the same as it was in the book, they're gonna rage. And you just have to ignore those people. I also have a spicy take. Mm. I don't think you can make a good adaptation that's a movie. Not now. Well, now that movies are totally different, like you'd have to go well, back to the way movies used to be. And and even then, I'm like, I think that I think that that yeah, maybe the early 2000s versions of movies. But I think ever since then, no, I think that books have that gift of time, that gift of freedom, uh, and that gift of like being able to understand the world that movies don't let you have uh and tv shows do so i i I genuinely believe that there is no good way to make an adaptation a movie now here's the other thing though i don't think everything that should be adapted should be a should be a tv show because there are some things that would just like i was like why are we making looking for alaska a tv show Wait, we're making it a TV show, not a movie? They made it. No, they made it a TV show. Looking for Alaska. Oh, I didn't either. Because you know why? Would make stupid TV. Like (laughs) what? That book is not long enough. Would make a bad adaptation, period. (laughs) The heck? I never saw that. I don't. I can't imagine wanting to see that. But yeah, Arya, you're right. There has to be a good balance. There has to be a good balance. And I think like kind of the the secret the secret um, ingredient when it comes to this. Like I had three questions, but really the secret ingredient 
is you have to have an actual artist doing the adaptation. It can't just be the machinations of Hollywood and like, this is popular, let's make an adaptation. You have to have somebody that's passionate about the source material, that really cares about the source material and thinks they can do something to the source material to either elevate it, or they think that they can do something to the source material to bring it to a new audience that would enjoy it, um, or something of that nature. And if you don't have that secret, like, passion ingredient, then you're just going to get an adaptation that becomes soulless. And I think that that's also why what you see to go back to the MCU from our earlier part of the conversation, that first part of the MCU from the beginning of Iron Man all the way up to like end game, you can see that there are moments of passion there where they really cared about the source material, even though the MCU is completely different than any of the, um, the comic book storylines that they adapted, the changes that they made show a lot of like artistic interest and, uh, and, and, and care for the source material. And then once they got to the end, I feel like because there was no overall throughput, they didn't know how to like find that again. And that's why no one cares about the MCU anymore. Like they should have ended it. But you can see it there. You can see it because nothing in the MCU is anything like the similar storylines in mm -hmm. comics. They're all totally different. But yeah. there's still still a lot of them are pretty good in the movies. Um, can I go? I just want to very quickly touch on that because I, I think it's important to remember the amount of people that we're talking about when it comes to fan fiction and the amount of people that we're talking about when it comes to like to reading a singular fan fiction mm -hmm. and the amount of people that we're talking about when it comes to watching a movie or a tv show mm -hmm. if there was something that was legitimized as far as the fanfic of being like yes this is the thing that happens and on the scale of what a tv show or movie would be it would be just as criticized and disliked as any ad adaptation yeah because yeah, so be, you can't you can't please everybody you can't. You can't. And now everyone can spew their opinions, what, however benign or inane they are, into the universe where everyone can read them. So thanks. Thanks, thanks Internet. <laughs> I, I also liked your uh, right now to the comment of Landon mm. on the streams here with me right now. Right now. Uh, right once now. more, trying to get all her friends to be I'm a Twitch saying, streamer. I'm just saying. <laughs> I think we could peer pressure Landon enough that she could go. I don't have time. I don't have time. I know. How will I read all of my books if I, I have know, to stream? Babe. You wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, I think that's our last slide, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna switch back to just to just us, just our beautiful faces. Um, so yeah, guys, in conclusion, books, movies, and TV shows are all very different. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. And adaptation is hard, actually. Adaptation in and of itself is its own art. Um, so I just wanted us to get a chance to really talk about our thoughts in that regard, just on its own, instead of like relating it to the specific piece of medium. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the applause, Lunar. Now Landon can live another week. <laughs> I'm alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm wondering if a movie adaptation have ever become fan in a way common fan fiction ideas become fan in. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you I would so love much. That. Thank you so much, Lunar. Oh my gosh. We'll do a pin for you. We'll do a pin for you um, afterwards. So yeah, yes. um, as far, so I think we'll, we'll end, we'll end the YouTube recording there. So if you guys are watching on the YouTube VOD, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. If you are going to comment and you've made it this far into the VOD, uh, please bully Landon into starting her own stream. <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead and bully me. I'm immune to peer pressure. I work with 12 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be very funny. It would be very funny. It would be, it would be a very fun too. stream. Mm -hmm. oh, all thank right you. so so thank you so much youtube for watching Not and of course dare. as always um don't forget to make it a great day and don't forget to be awesome <laughs>